Hello, welcome to Warrior Painters Podcast number three. I taught myself art. I'm Alvin, your host for this session, and in this podcast, you will learn there is more than one path to art mastery. And by the end, you'll take away resources for giving yourself a solid education as well as motivation to keep discipline. Let's go. Today, we'll be hearing the stories of four individuals Caroline, Sean, James, and Ephraim. Mm. But before we begin, a short announcement from us, the Warrior Painter admins. Warrior Painters provides a library of direct human knowledge, as well as support and motivation to help you improve and be the badass painter you've always wanted to be. If you enjoy listening to our lectures and demos, feel enriched by the circle of like-minded creatives and improved your skills since joining us, then please consider donating. It's not just a donation, it's an investment that will ultimately return to you in the form of future events and bigger talks and demos. With that being said, let's welcome today's guests. <laughs> welcome, guys. Welcome. Four of you are self-taught. You've never went to a formal art training. Is that a yeah or no? Nah? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. Uh, I wouldn't really say that. I have taken some institutions around LA. I'm an imposter as well. You have well. to get I, the knowledge. I, I, I did go to a four-year school, but I, I didn't learn enough there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. actually slightly an imposter. I did one year of illustration in a university before dropping out. Well, one and a half year before dropping out. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Caroline here, anything. Caroline here is the only one real that's self-taught a real self-taught artist. Okay. Get so out of here, all of you. <laughs> one real self-taught artist. Shame. One, one uh, university dropout. <laughs> And two that say that they hadn't learned anything from school, so they're teaching themselves. Uh, we got some questions for you. A brief introduction of who you are and what you do for a living right now. We'll start with Caroline. Hello, I'm Caroline. I am a full-time painter. I'm a fine artist, and I specialize in oil painting, mostly portraiture, but we'll see in the future. I've also done teaching in the past, and I technically would be teaching right now if it weren't for the current pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also work part-time as a barista. Great. Awesome. Me too. I was a barista before too. Let's go to Ephraim. I'm a self-taught uh, digital artist. Um, I do some uh, freelance illustration, um, but mostly I make my daily bread through um, a series of <laughs> menial jobs like office work and kitchen work and stuff like that. Um, so, like, I mean, after I uh, left university, after I dropped out, uh, I did about like sort of 10 or 11 years of kind of like low income general work. And that's what I continue to do today outside of um, art um, as I try and get into the industry. So that's... Uh, you're, you're doing a real hustle life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're real grinding out there. I respect that. Trying. James. I'm kind of just an unemployed <laughs> artist right now, <laughs> but I'm still like studying watching some art station lectures like every day. And also I do like some investing on the side though too. Okay. So, okay. All right, cool. Yeah, pretty much. Maybe you'll have to uh, give us a uh, lecture on investing. <laughs> mm. All right, Sean. My name's Sean and uh, I love games and all types of games like board games, video games. So that's where my kind of root of inspiration is from. Up to this point, I do illustration and I do uh, layout design for entertainment currently. Yeah, I just saw your Hobbit stuff. That was really cool. Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, let's go. Next question. What did you want to be when you were growing up? I think in my earliest days, I wanted to be a teacher, but that seems to be a common one just because our own teachers are the first uh, real occupation that we get into contact with. And I think after that, my most, um, right around high school I think I wanted to be an artist but that didn't happen until after I got a degree in something else. I have a feeling it changed quite chaotically as I grew uh, older but um, like the things that I remember was wanting to become a mad scientist or a wizard so I wasn't really like, a really <laughs> grounded kid. <laughs> yeah. Starting to develop a wizard's beard. So yes and that's probably the closest did. I'll get to true wizardhood. Um, and uh, you're but... also developing wizardry in light and color. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. James, what did you want to be? I think when I was in high school, I always just wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know necessarily what the art industry was until like later on. I didn't know even there was even things like concept art or like even fine art painting. I just know I just wanted to do art. So, but 
I guess I kind of just alternate always in between being being an illustrator, fine artist, or concept artist. So right now I'm just trying to pursue a concept art career for now. There you go, man. Chase Pretty the much. dream. All right. And finally, Sean, what did you want to be as a kid? Something like a mix of uh, like a space explorer um, and archaeologist. You know, I was really into Indiana Jones and Star Wars. So I think those two kind of um, like the idea of digging up uh, fossils and learning about uh, ancient worlds and things like that. That's what nice. I wanted to do. That's some romantic ass shit right there. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I always liked uh, dinosaurs and stuff. All right. <laughs> We're off to a great start, guys. Mm. Next question. How did you learn that people can make a living as an artist? When I was in university, I had met these um, artists on the internet. And they were all coming from different backgrounds, but also pursuing concept art on the side or like moonlighting as uh, students. And um, that's when I first learned about the concept art industry. But um, fine art was actually after I had graduated school from engineering. And I kind of stumbled into this oil painting workshop. And seeing that artist living and working as a fine art in the modern day opened my eyes to the possibility of living off of one's art. I, don't, I, th I think the awareness of, uh, of like the earning part of being an artist came much later. Like, I think I was like first just really enamored by the front page of Deviant Art, and that inspired me to pick up digital art. Um, this is when I was a teenager. And then much, much later, probably like, I don't know, eight years later or so, there was an increasing trend of like artists sharing their process, sharing their journey. Before it was like a bit of a dark, like a dark, a, a black box. Artists didn't seem to be sharing their process. They didn't seem, seem to be sharing their experiences. And then suddenly I think I came across a, like a Noah Bradley article talking about his journey and that both inspired me to become a better artist, but also made me realize that you could go from nothing to being a professional artist and earning a pretty decent life. I think I kind of like learned it from like art school. I didn't know that you could probably make money off of this. Then I saw like some students that were presenting work for like concept art and then they told me that there was an actual career in it. I was like, oh, okay, you could actually make money off of this. And it's how like games actually got their graphics. <laughs> so that's how I kind of like learned it. I think it was also like the same for like fine art painting. I didn't even know there was like galleries or anything. I thought all the old masters just went extinct somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, maybe someday you'll be a master too, James. Yeah, you'll be, so hopefully you'll be a master before you become extinct too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, finally, Sean. I learned kind of a few different levels. So like in art school, no one was talking really about like careers or how to make a living except to go to graduate school and maybe become a professor. So um, I Googled it uh, back in the day and found this book, uh, How to Sell Yourself Without Selling Your Soul or something like that by Carol Lloyd. And mm. she laid out the fine art market. So later I got some work in galleries. I was just hanging up the artwork, you know, cleaning and stuff. But I got to see professionals like doing it. But it wasn't until going to like a fantasy convention that I saw like sci-fi and fantasy, the kind of art I wanted to make an artist like selling it year after year and seeming to do pretty well, so. Cool, all right. Well, let's get to the meat of the conversation the actual journey and the practices of being self-taught. What's your, what's your routine? How do you teach yourself? Do you look up videos? Do you go to books or what? So I'm curious because I went to school and it, it was just laid out for me. So I don't have to figure it out myself. I think my uh, style of learning is very self-directed. I spend my time pursuing A, what I'm interested in and B, um, a lot of reading the internet, for sure, back in the day when Divian Art was a big thing, a lot of artists were sharing their own resources. I also dug through the library a bunch. And then when YouTube came around, a lot of resourceful materials were on there. Most amount of learning I did is through just trial and error, I would say. Um, grabbing a concept and then doing it obsessively until I get it. Whoa. Yeah. And in terms of routine, I'm not sure that I had one. Like I didn't have a daily schedule for learning. I was just constantly painting and reading and learning. The whole time, did you have this studio? How long have you had this studio? 
Oh, well, I've been a, you know, working artist for a few years. In this studio, I've been here for three years, but a lot of the time, you know, it was at home. I also rented part-time studios outside. Um, I jumped around a couple of shared studios until I got my own studio here. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. All right, uh, E-Frame. So what's your, what's your routine for going about learning art on your own? I feel like it's changed so much just in the last six months and probably even in the last like month and a half to two months of joining um, the Worry Painters Discord since, uh, you know, since the world ended. <laughs> well, normal life, um, more normal life came to a pause. Um, so it's like, it's a bit hard to say. I, th I feel like I, uh, my learning process has been really chaotic and unstructured and led by what interested me at the time, um, but not really knowing how to learn not really knowing the business of learning like um so i just try something and watch a tutorial and think that that was enough or i would do a painting and then put it to one side and feel like that had been a learning exercise i'm um, not really like um knowing the concept of fundamentals until much later until um watching some uh like probably the the name noah bradley will come up a lot when it comes because he was the start of my learning to learn. I would say that the first 10 years of painting was like trying something, putting it up on DeviantArt and wondering why no one loved it. And then, mm. you know, giving up on painting for a month or two months and then being bit by the bug again. Um, so like, that's not really learning. And, and even in the last sort of couple of years since in the last five years of taking it more seriously, um, uh, it's become like more and more structured. I don't think I really answered the question, <laughs> but um, uh, just to say that it, it is really a, a living document kind of thing, situation where it's just kind of constantly evolving. Right. Uh, most recently, I find that um, I, I feel like I'm starting to get the edges of the puzzle, and that means that things are starting to slot together. And it means that um, uh, even less practice is becoming more relevant. Like, so doing a master study, I feel like I'm understanding or learning more from each one, even if I don't have a particular goal when I start that master study, by the end of it, I feel like I can sit down and say, well, actually, um, something tangible, like I, I feel like I learned something about how this master uses color in, sh in shadow, like these, these notes of like color and stuff like that. Or I feel like um, I, I, I got an appreciation of the shape. Um, I feel like uh, it's gotten easier. Different things have started to come closer together and, uh, and that makes it a lot like less chaotic in a way. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So basically your journey is like a book that writes the pages as you turn them. Yes. Or like a cockroach wow. on a patio, oh, like cool. wandering around <laughs> <Got it right. laughs> yeah. looking for food. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I that that was it. very the poetic. I like it. You sound like a scavenger then. <laughs> <laughs> what, James? Yeah. A scavenger. Um, you know, like. No, I think he's talking game. about my cockroach thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I, Right. To totally yeah like i i feel like i it's like assembling things from because that's the thing like you have so many different sources so many different authority sources um like there's no syllabus made for you you have to kind of like take what you can from something try it out if it's not clicking or not working try something else study from someone else and it's like chaotic that's what it feels like um, mm. but getting there <laughs> right okay uh james what's your routine for teaching yourself stuff every day you already mentioned you listen to art station lectures, right? Yeah, that was like recently though. So, I mean, just from like eight to five, I usually have like some sort of project I do. So I kind of like time myself on those projects so I could figure out how long I would continue on to that project. And after five, I just like walk my dog. Then six, I come back home, start watching those art station lectures for like maybe three or two hours. After that, I kind of just draw something a bit. Like after art school, I didn't have that too much money to like invest in like art schools, art classes anymore because now they're just they were just like expensive in LA. It was like eight hundred dollars or nine hundred dollars for like brainstorm and CDA classes. So I had to think about something that was like low low brow and a bit high tech. Uh, so I just used like the, the power of the internet. And yeah, Eframe mentioned like Noah Bradley. I took his mentorship course once and it was like cheap. <laughs> there have been like groups that have like come and gone, like conceptart.org that I used to get like some resources from. It was like CG Hub or something that was gone now. 
Uh, con let's see, Crimson Daggers was a group I used to go to. That's pretty much it. Is that still off the table for you, going to those uh, ateliers like CDA and Brainstorm? Well, I guess since I'm unemployed, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I have to think of something that's not too capital intensive, something that's not going to cost too much money, but still get me like up to date information. Uh, information is always good. All right, Sean, yeah. what about you? What's your daily routine? It's evolved over the years for sure, but I usually try to do some reading every day on a subject that's like relevant or just interesting. Then it depends on the, the day, like the projects for the day, but I typically try to set aside an hour to practice something. Um, and usually that's focused towards like a greater like skill that I want to learn. Like right now I'm doing uh, 3D modeling every day just to practice. Um, aside from, yeah, a ton of books and, and talking to other people about what things they're reading, that's really helpful. And yeah, groups like the, the Warrior Painter Discord, honestly, like I'll go in there and do a couple sketches before I go to an actual project. You guys are so uh, disciplined. That's great. What do you think a person would need the key aspects um, to teach yourself? Because you don't have a class to go to, so you, you don't have that accountability. So how would you build that discipline for yourself? Write down a schedule and try to follow it. It might sound good in your head, but if you write it down, at least you have something that's a bit fixed. Also, you can't be a concept artist if you don't really have the tools. So I suggest investing in like some good hardware, like a laptop, computers, and also like the program too, or software. I think one of the, the cheapest ways is to, especially for concept art, is to just draw from imagination because that, you know, you can draw from life and that's really good. But if you sketch from imagination, you're practicing like visualization and, and just really exploring. So I think that's like a really great cheap way to learn. Yeah, so there's, uh, in our Discord, there's a lot of uh, younger artists. Some are just graduating high school and they're considering of going to art school. What do you think of that? Do you think it's viable to just go ahead and just start teaching yourself right away? Or do you think they should go to art school at least for a year or so? Uh, what's up? You're asking a bunch of self artists, self taught artists, whether or not they should go to art school. <laughs> I mean, did you, that was basically going to be my answer. Should like, we phrase what, that? I mean, what? do you wish you went to art school or are you happier teaching yourself? I wish I'd found the community sooner because um, I was doing it in isolation um, and then just posting the stuff on like DeviantArt or ArtStation later or Twitter or Instagram and then judging my success by the likes, um, which is not a healthy no, no, or no. particularly fun no, yeah. or even useful in any way. Yeah. So I, I, I would say that um, maybe, maybe not art school, but certainly try and find peers like above you and your level and below you. Does it like regardless, like find artists that can critique your work, that can share your journey um, and don't do it like alone. If you can do that, I, I would imagine that there's so much online that you might not need to invest such a high price to go to art school but mm. what do i know because i'm not yet in the industry so <laughs> yeah mm. i think if you're if you're considering it like really research who's teaching the classes and make sure that every teacher does live demonstrations mm. um yeah. that was the biggest failing of my school is that one or two adjuncts not even professors would give like full demos in the, the yeah, whole four why years to, why are you going to school if uh, you can't see him demo yeah waste the money yeah pretty much but the yeah. community is the most important part so yeah that is one advantage of going to school you automatically have you're surrounded by a group of peers which you can network and uh, also use for critiques motivation oh we have a question this is a relevant question how far out do you plan your studies that moment that day that week for me, I kind of just plan it usually by like what kind of project I'm doing. So practice like drawing dogs it's required in that project and practice drawing them. <laughs> That's what I kind of do. I try to keep it flexible and uh, like treat it more like a marathon. As long as I was going to show up for that next painting and that next study, um, that was the most important thing. The times when I couldn't do art for a month or something, let, let that not be uh, an, uh, the end of it. Um, so, uh, but it, when I have like free time, like now, or when I'm working part-time, I will try and plan out the day, um, in detail 
and the week in general, like I'll say, like I want to finish us, I want to finish um, the homework for this course by Sunday, and uh, I want to have done uh, some client work or some paintings uh, by this day, and then you know, like when it comes to that morning, I'll plan out the day in more detail. Like I want to do a quick master study to warm up, or I want to do. I, I've started doing. Um, gesture sketches 30 second gesture sketches to warm up before anything like either freelance work or or painting for fun just do that um, and I find that's really really helpful so I will just like plan it out on the day I find that if you are so rigid with the plan you're planning like plan yeah. out the whole week you, yeah. and, and you burn out or you like yeah. you deviate from the plan you'll become very disheartened and especially if there are other things like work and stuff like that yeah because sometimes yeah. you'll make plans that are bigger than you can actually accomplish like your For eyes sure. are bigger than your stomach i would recommend anyone in the beginning to study from people that truly inspire you even if you don't quite know why um you're developing your own like taste and personal i, I don't want to say style style is not the word i'm looking for but um you know whatever attracts you about the other person's work is what you ultimately want in your own work and in the past, I also did daily exercises where I kind of tie myself to either like half an hour or an hour. And I just do a painting of a study of something on someone else's work that I really like. And mm. doesn't matter if I'm not done by the time that the timer's done, I stop and do my own work. But keeping up with that every day on a regular basis really helped. Yeah, and to, to add on to that, like collect those artworks and save them over the years. So you, you create this uh, mm. library that you can always go and study from where some projects you may just need like to learn quick how to draw something. Uh, that's like your long-term kind of learning. Yeah, and it's also good to keep your old work because that way you can track your progress. Were there any, do you guys have any mentors? Yeah, Either a virtual lot. or real? Well, my first mentor was probably my grandma who had like a, a 10 year art career but not while I was around. So like when I grew up, she, she didn't have an art career, but she had knowledge of it. So she would take me to museums and things like that. And then in college, I met this guy, Mark David Gray, who had gone to art school like in the 60s and like came back. It was during the Great Recession. So like everything was kind of going to hell. And um, so I met him in school there and he started a studio space after where people could just work on personal projects. And so we just hung out there a lot and um, he'd share books and experiences. And, and from then on, I, I realized you can kind of learn um, from a lot of different mentors. I'm just always trying to see who's out there making really cool work and just listen to them. So I think being a good listener will give you access to a lot of mentors. No, I think maybe it's like Kirk Shinoda. I had it like as a mentor. Once. You mean the guy that just taught our figure drawing session last night? Yeah, I used to like, I guess you could say just follow him around because I used to like take his classes wherever he was like teaching or something. So, What was the most important thing you learned from Kirk? I think it was like mostly the figure drawing stuff and the anatomy and just making really good gestures and also like some design principles, compositions. I feel like Bill Perkins was kind of like also a mentor too because he just had like a not, lot of knowledge especially like in the industry. I did also mention I took that Noah Bradley mentorship, but I kind of feel like it wasn't really a mentorship since you couldn't really communicate with him. <laughs> he was just like posts just like videos and it's like, oh, here are these assignments you need to do. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. How do you guys know when you have an art breakthrough? Does that even happen? Are you constantly struggling? So it's mostly slow and incremental for me. There are moments where I look back and say, that was actually a, like a breakthrough painting or something like like it was on a level that was much higher than what I was producing before and sometimes even much better than some of the things that I produce immediately after like something clicked and then I will try and work out why what happened during that process and how I worked and what worked well and what was inefficient um, so that does help but usually like from day to day it feels for me it feels slow but then sometimes you look back and you say well in the last month or so I produced Quite a lot of paintings and I feel like I actually did upskill like noticeably. Breakthrough is like for me it's like some sort of revolution so oh no I mean there's like a paradigm where it was like oh well okay I could give you an example um, 
like before I didn't know any anatomy and I thought I didn't never need an anatomy. I thought all I had to do was just copy the shapes on the model until like Curve showed me, oh, you know, anatomy is like important. It's kind of like a map for you. It helps you like um, delineate all the like the muscles and figure out all the forms are inside and out of the human figure. And after I like studied anatomy, oh, then I found out that everything was just much more easier. And I was like, oh, wait. And then I started to think, oh, wow, why didn't I study before? It's like, huh, <laughs> this old inefficient way of just copying the model was just, wow. <laughs> that was just so stupid, I realized. <laughs> was, yeah, the old way was gone. The new one was in, and that was it. <laughs> I love the passion, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah James. I agree with James. Like, um, a lot, like a lot of it's like learning what you don't know. And then you realize like, oh my God, I didn't know this really basic thing. Like I went to art school, but I don't know how to mix complementary colors. Like, oh my God. And then, so that's the breakthrough. And then the learning is like following up. And I think the second breakthrough is when you actually get it. Yeah, I'd like, uh, like I only discovered like shape language recently, the idea, the concept, essentially design in, in any kind of like, like just say, not just saying, oh, you should design stuff, but like actually breaking down what that means. Mm -hmm. And that has yeah. actually been a breakthrough. So there is definitely like breakthroughs, but yeah. not necessarily in your work, but in your understanding. I think for me, um, in my own work, I would agree with Ephraim that I don't notice progress um, day to day. But in terms of breakthroughs, sometimes when I discover new artists or looking at other people's work that is trying to say the same thing I'm trying to say, but in a different way, that usually lights a bulb in my head just because it's possibly a way of doing something that I want to do that I haven't thought of yet. And then I would like try to reverse engineer that and think about how it's applicable to my own work and kind of like critically analyze, you know, why do I like this? What is drawing me to this? How can I take this but make it my own kind of thing? A recent one is uh, Ewan Uglo. I really resonated with his use of geometry and flat planes and his color. Ewan Uglo. Can yeah. you type that in the chat for if people yeah. want to reference that? Okay, tips on how to survive the self-learning journey. Where if someone decides, hey, I'm not going to go to school. I'm a teacher myself. Where should they start? And what advice would you give them? I think for me, what, what's been really important is staying in like art adjacent fields. So even if you're you're not where you wanna be, like uh, my first jobs were in um, art supply shops, you know, which was close to art and artists would come through and you'd, you might hear about a book and, and that'd kind of help your, mm -hmm. your learning um, or working at an art gallery or a community art gallery. I think those are important, like staying art adjacent as much as you can. That's a good tip. Then I think Ephraim had something that he wanted to say, right? Yeah, I, I actually, um, from the Rory Painters podcast, um, I just listened to the uh, interview with Angela and the bit she said at the end really resonated. It's not something I ever put into words. It was essentially about like fighting that, the, the mental game, the mental fight um, is pretty important as a self-taught artist because there'll be a long period where you don't have out external um, reinforcement um, and uh, you know maybe only your friends or your, clo or your family are passionate or supportive. Um, so it's uh, remaining compassionate to yourself. Uh, I know that sounds really vague, but like um, there will come a time when uh, you're getting better and you're starting to get noticed or, um, and uh, you will realize the only reason you lasted this, this long was because um, you were patient with yourself um, and because you cared for yourself and cared for, for, for art. Like there's different kinds of being hard on yourself. Uh, like just being strict as a teacher, but also compassionate. What I so. was going to say was actually going to completely counter each frames. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. For me, um, what I found was the ultimate drive behind um, teaching myself art is holding myself accountable. Being compassionate to yourself is important. At the same time, um, also ask yourself, why do you want to be an artist? Mm -hmm. And what, what is your ultimate goal here and you know anytime there's a good show on Netflix that you can binge or you know all, all these other distractions that you could do you could do it and then you'll regret it later for me a lot of it was just pure stubbornness I would say um, determination in a way that I just 
I was not satisfied with myself unless I could do it. I probably lost a lot of sleep that way. So not for everybody, but I would say for the self-taught artist, because there's no one to hold your hand or no one to tell you what to do, you have to know what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. And the actions that you take for yourself will, you know, in the end, if you make it or don't make it, in the end, it's all up to you. Even if you go to school, I would say, yeah. everything is what you make out of it. No one else is responsible for yourself. So I think being disciplined that way is very important. Mm. I totally agree with that, though. It's like, uh, I meant more like a compassion in terms of when you're looking at your results and saying, why am I not getting better? Or why, what, like, that's where you need to show that. But like, absolutely, if you're playing video games 60 hours a week and you're not painting, you need to have a word with yourself yeah. um, if you mm -hmm. want to get better. If you want it as a hobby, perfectly fine. Do what feels good. But like having compassion with your, yourself probably would not be the same as doing what feels always good, but rather just not beating yourself up so hard when when progress is slower than, than you'd want. Um, yeah. And then to add to the, the discipline part, look at where you're spending your time. So really track your day from when you wake up and see how much time you spend, you know, cooking food, see how much time you spend actually doing stuff and track every single moment of the day. You're going to get a good idea of if you're spending your energy where it should be. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, you have right. to be super self-critical. But I do kind of agree with Ephraim too in that like with the criticalness, you also have to believe in yourself mm -hmm. to a degree. I think that's where the compassion is really important. Uh, I think we could start on our on the Q&A session, we got a few questions lined up in the chat. How important is patience when it comes to learning a new art skill or concept for a project? Very. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you need to dedicate yourself to see a certain vision. You have to go usually see it through, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, like how I used to paint was I would be impatient and I would skip the study and I'd start the painting and then ruin the painting. <laughs> and then have to go back to do the study anyways. So you, uh, that, that feeling of impatience, um, you're actually saving time. I've done that too. Sometimes I just uh, go for it, get to the end, and I skip some stuff, and I'm wondering why it doesn't look how it should be. Um, but that in itself is a way of learning too. I kind of learn things the hard way all the time. <laughs> Next question, how do you guys deal with learning stuff? Do you want to get over with? Are you anxious about learning things as quickly as possible what okay i'll, I'll just say because it's really brief i i think i definitely uh i want to be earning um as an artist full-time either freelancing or, uh, or uh, more recently i really wanted to enter the entertainment industry and be in the studio um and learn in that context as well so there's definitely a, a real impatience inside of me that I, I have to kind of like try and dial down and realize that this is going to be slow i'm having to constantly remind myself to be patient all right and then uh, we have another question from michelle some students may find that they are dealing with a lot of pressure or disapproval from their family to pursue a degree or a more practical career did any of you guys face that kind of pressure and if so do you have advice to offer those who also want to pursue a self-study path with an art education in other words did you have parents that want you to get a real job i mean yes i left a uh, real job to pursue art I could go on for hours about that, but in short, for me, uh, I made the decision to leave my engineering career to be an artist after a lot, a lot of consideration and talking to a lot of different people. And my parents were not happy for the longest time. I don't know that they're still okay with this, but you know, life is short. We don't know when we're gonna die. And if I were to step outside right now and get hit by a bus, I want to feel like I've tried or have done everything that I wanted to do with my life. And mm. that was a big decision. Because in the end, your parents, your family, the ones that love you, they just want what's best for you. If you can show them that uh, you're able to take care of yourself with what you're doing, they should be okay with it. And if they're not, ultimately, it is your life. That's what made me, long story short, make the decision. Yeah, it's your life. In short, I don't care what they think. Oh, cool. <laughs> What's that um, Bon Jovi song? <laughs> it's my life when now or never. Everybody live forever. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Karaoke town. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. Karaoke hour. Musical interlude. Yeah. All right, next question. 
I feel like my biggest frustration is the speed of my work. I feel like I'm always way slower than my peers and I'm worried I won't be able to keep up with a professional schedule. Have you had similar feelings? Do you have any recommendations on how to think about your speed and your work? Yeah, I think for me, I, I felt that way a lot. And then I realized it was because I was like working multiple jobs, various different projects, um, like low level freelance going on. And so all that time gets split up. And in a studio, you have like eight hours or more just all in a line and it's all very focused. So I think it's, it's a reasonable fear um, to be slower, but you're probably not is the truth of it. It's probably just other circumstances and the, the environment you're creating work in. I also want to add that professionals um, have had probably more time to do the same thing and naturally practice will make you faster. At the same time, treat yourself like a professional as in like, you know, if you're doing the best that you can, then that's the current speed that you have. But if you're kind of just like, oh, well, I'm not a pro, then obviously, you know. I think maybe the first thing I kind of did when I thought about something like this, I was like, try to ignore it and then try to keep doing what I was always doing because I thought, oh, patience would also like pan out in the end. But then I kind of realized, oh, no, the, my speed rate is like for producing stuff is still the same rate. <laughs> it's not very competitive for an industry level. But I think maybe if you like keep studying, keeping like your information up to date and looking like at other artists when they provide like tutorials on like much more efficient like work methods you can never know it's like some people may have like better like workflow methods than you so yeah quality is more important though so focus on that speed will come with time yeah speed will come with time experience um okay next question do you find as self-taught artists that your styles fit or don't fit what is considered established do you find yourself trying to learn what is considered good or looking for something outside the norm? Mm, that's a good question. Because I felt that way with fine art. I was doing kind of like sci-fi, trying to do concept art without realizing it, but and then showing that in fine art galleries. And it, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> it didn't work for me. You know. Um, Can you elaborate on, on that? Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, just drawing like spaceships and landscapes and things like that, and then framing it up to put into exhibits and um that type of work mm -hmm. i mean it, it also wasn't very good at the time either but it stylistically it, it wasn't fitting so i think it's okay to like follow your own style for a while but then if you know of a place that you want to work then create a whole new portfolio uh geared towards that is what i would say right because from a fine art perspective my answer for this question is perhaps not that relevant to the concept art industry or those that want to get into concept art. But from a fine arts perspective, it's the most important thing is staying true to your own vision, which is not necessarily true when you're working for another studio. So, you know, give or take my advice on this. But for me personally, I'm not thinking about my style at all. What I'm doing is simply pursuing what interests me and the style that comes from it is more like an accumulation of that process. I call it kind of having uh, your own handwriting. You know, you don't think about it. It just happens as you do it. Maybe someone else can chime in about the concept art industry. I did some digital matte painting where um, for a studio where you had to adapt to different styles. And so I think if you're interested in learning more about style, do master's studies of the style you want to learn and then try to fuse it with your own style so such that your handwriting, like Caroline said, still comes through. So you're not just copying their style, but you're mm -hmm. actually offering something on top of that. Okay, next question. I ultimately want to work in paint and color. My drawing drafting is okay. So I've been taking classes to build up that skill. Should I continue to try and round out my skills by taking courses and skills I find lacking or really dive into paint and color so I can build my portfolio around that? both maybe yeah yeah <laughs> it feels like you yeah. should strengthen your strength your strong points but also address your weak points and if you've got finite time um i can understand that would be difficult um maybe like or finite money for courses and stuff but um i would definitely address the things you're weakest at because that's a weakness and it will bring everything else down as well and that's been told from me like my figure drawing is particularly 
stiff. Um, and uh, it brings down the level of the work that I'm doing. It's noticeable. Even if I lavish all the care in the world for color and light, if my figure is, the focal point of my image is a figure and the figure is wonky <laughs> or stiff. Um, so it's like, um, yeah, address your weak, weak point, I would say, but also double down on the thing you're passionate about and the thing you think you want to pursue further. I also want to say, if you already clearly know that painting is what you want to do now, and um, I agree with Ephraim that we should always be improving on our weaker points, but why not just dive into painting anyway? As you're doing that, the things that you're lacking and that you need to learn will become apparent to you. Mm -hmm. Painting and drawing are very, very related. So if you jump into painting and you realize that, oh, wait, actually, I don't, I don't actually know how this object works. I need to learn how to draw it first. Now you can mm -hmm. go back, but with a more clear goal of what it is you're trying to do, as opposed to the way I'm reading your question, feels more like, oh, I'm just grinding through the drawing so that I can get to painting later. They're very, very close. And if you just do painting first or do painting right now based on your current um, knowledge base from drawing and drafting, it'll, it'll be more obvious what you need to focus on after that. Good answer, Caroline. All right, uh, moving on. What do you suggest is the best way of going about studying anatomy? Get your hands on some cadavers. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could do that, but this, there are like books like Bridgman, Loomis, and also like Vilpu is also like a good reference to. Yeah, I'd start with like a skeleton, draw the yeah. skeleton, and then draw the, the next layer of the like muscles. muscle. And then uh, the fat and then the skin, like just go from bottom to, to top. From inside out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the truth is inside you. <laughs> Another thing is uh, make sure that you're, uh, because this is what's hampered my study of anatomy several times and I've stalled and stopped, is make sure that you're um, comfortable with rotating 3D forms, mm -hmm. like 3D, uh, 3D primitives in, in space. Yeah. Um, because I find that a lot of the time, um, that is what is limiting my, my study of, of anatomy. At the beginning, I couldn't see it. Now I can see it, and it's something I'm working on. If you're trying to study anatomy and it's not sticking or you're still kind of like, if it's yes. flattening down, uh -huh. then you probably need to work on your intuitive use of, of volume in space. That's a different thing to study. Um, Drawbox is a good one. Um, yeah. Also, mm -hmm. getting a 3D program like Blender and just um, mucking about with it um, has really helped me. Yeah. I think you also need to like study some perspective since you require like that knowledge of depth. So, uh, okay, let's move on. When learning, do you choose a subject, for example, value, perspective, anatomy, etc., and decide a certain amount of time to spend on it before moving on to another, or do you jump around and spend different amounts of time on different subjects as you feel? I think mm -hmm. you'll notice that you need everything. So as you're practicing, um, you can set aside certain like exercises. For example, take one image and only study the value. So only paint it in black and white. Mm -hmm. But as you're doing that, you know, perspective and what, what other things did they mention? Um, value, perspective, anatomy. Right. All those things matter. And they'll eventually all come back to haunt you, basically. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I personally, in my mind, I don't really separate them. I feel like when I practice, though, it's like I usually have like one sheet of paper and I would just like try to fill it out as much as I can. <laughs> and sometimes that would like even take like a long time for me. So, yeah, I agree with uh, Caroline, like a bit of everything. So, if you're taking a longer course, maybe like a uh, 10 week course, you know, dedicate 10 weeks to that. Whereas if you're doing a, like I'll do a 15 minute sketch every day where I just set a timer and just free draw. So I think from you know 15 minutes to like years long plans of what to study, it's all good, all needed. And uh, let's see, what are the things that you're working on right now? What are the things you wanna teach yourself next? I'm currently taking a class actually on multi-figure composition, how to effectively say a complicated narrative basically. Um, and in previous chats on Discord, I think I was chatting with maybe you, Alvin, about the distinction between looking at a painting versus painting for uh, animation, uh, concept art, um, things like that, where the goal um, for concept art, in my understanding, because I wouldn't know, is to have the simple idea and be able to communicate that in a matter of seconds. 
uh, because audience, the audience doesn't have that much time to pause on each frame. Whereas in a painting, you have infinite amount of time, but no sequential movement, I guess, to help guide your audience. So everything is ha happening simultaneously at the same time. Right. It's a different way of treating an image and how to tell a narrative with one flat 2D surface. That's what I'm working on right now. Yeah, I think for like my next project, I'm gonna try to like design some assets for games. I think also like learning for some 3D for me. Uh, right now I'm taking a character design class at Brainstorm online. And then just practicing some 3D modeling on the side, just little still lifes. Cool, Ephraim, what about you? What are you lacking right now you feel that you need to still teach yourself? Yeah, so I, I've just started, um, I'm like on the second week of a schoolism course, um, uh, Intro to Phys Dev by Victoria Ying, um, because I really wanted to have a little, a little bit more of a, a process for design, a little bit more um, mileage, like some, knowing how to think, how to problem solve with that. And I felt like, yeah, I can definitely improve my, uh, my figures. That's definitely still a weakness, but on any, in any level and certainly seeing as I'm still doing illustrations, I feel like design would be something that would immediately um, help. Um, so that's that's the, the thing I'm doing immediately. Um, and then I, I want to take a course after that on uh, like gestural drawing uh, or something like that, like uh, uh, gestural drawing and anatomy. There's some on schoolism. After that, I want to double down on color and light. There's, there's just tons. There's almost not enough time. You can sleep when you're dead, Ephraim. Yes. Yep. There's never, the learning never stops. <laughs> Even if you are a formally trained, went to art university, when you graduate school, you're just at the beginning, man. There's no finish line. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's close out. Do you guys have any quick words or advice for those people starting out or also in the journey of being self-taught? What's your motto? I'd say follow your passions, but do some calculations as well. Hold yourself accountable. Everything is what you make of it. Find your peers as soon as possible. Don't do it. Don't struggle alone. And um, understand that Rome wasn't built in a day. That's cliched, but like, it's going to be a pretty long journey when you're starting out. Um, it's totally worth it. Try to remember to enjoy it. Uh, and mm. uh, life will try and get in the way. Um, so don't lose sight of what, you know, like fun stuff and bad stuff will try and get in the way. Um, so On that note, Ephraim, actually, I want to add to what Ephraim is saying also that you can't possibly be studying 24 seven all the time. Art imitates life, right? <laughs> so you need to live life to allow those things to come back into your art. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Even for a concept art for your imagination, like look for your sources of inspiration and they're not always in visual forms or other people's art per se. So it's important to get out and just, you know, live a little. Yeah, yeah live a little, guys. Exercise. Yes. It yeah. really does help. It like helps your learning. Whatever exercise might mean for you, depending on your fitness level and your ability and stuff, but definitely exercise cool awesome and james did you had did you say anything yet uh, i was kind of thinking maybe art is kind of like an investment you know you put your time you could think of it as money yep. you could also think of it as your capital and so when you study something you know you expect to get something out of it it's kind of like also like investing in stocks do you ever do anything for fun where you don't expect anything from it uh, i don't know i kind of feel like life's like a chess game it's like you gotta think three steps ahead what about when you so, sing karaoke for us? What are you get, hoping to get out of that? Singing Korea. Um, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that was like something in the mood. <laughs> so, all right, yeah. that was a great uh, motto there, James. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> On that note. And that's the end of the podcast, guys. We're going to do the outro song. If you want to sing along, you can. Oh, no. The karaoke here <laughs> in this podcast. <sighs> Thanks for watching the Warrior Painters podcast, guys. We'll see you next time. Sometimes the pain dries out The gouache gets all crusty So just spray it down really good 
yo Ran out of yellow tube, cost $20 Can't afford that, so gotta walla 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 That's how we battle, wicked warriors go paint outdoors Anytime, no plane, no game We got to switch so we can see all the hues of orange like Steve E Oil paints always dry slow You never know if you don't go paint We are Warrior Painters Podcast Go Paint This is Warrior Painters Podcast Go Paint All that mixing is bold Just put cool colors next to all